lot of my work with women around the world is about identifying leaders at community level, at national level, at global level who are role models. And you know, in my life, I have not got here on my own. Obviously, I've got here because of very um, inspirational people. So this first slide, Megan is beaming. Um, this first slide, as one of my first kind of introductory sessions with first year undergraduates doing development studies, I like to ask them, it's a bit of a participatory exercise, I like to ask them um, to bring in an object that kind of symbolises what motivated them to decide to do um, development, get all sorts of wild and wacky things get brought in. But in answering the question myself, actually there should be a few things um, up there. The first thing that should be up there is a head-to-toe Peter Storm outfit with welly boots. <laughs> You know what's coming, mother and father. So, in my younger years, I'm one of three. My brother, sister, and I were bundled off at weekends in rural Shropshire to various archaeological digs. And interestingly, usually in the winter when it was raining. Now, my sister, who was very successful at finding the bits of pot, loved it. So did my brother, who was less successful, but he embraced the wet and the cold, Hannah frequently got promoted up to the washroom in the dry to sort her bits of pot. I never found a single bit of pot, and this went on for years. <laughs> so my brother and sister went on to study classics and archaeology, and I decided I would be studying people who were in front of me that I could speak to in the warm. <laughs> so, thank you, parents, because it was you know, defining experience that shaped me, but obviously in a different way from my siblings. The other uh, artefact or symbol is Ganesh. Some of you may be familiar with Ganesh. Ganesh is a really um, popular deity in Hinduism, and he represents good luck, and he's a remover of obstacles. So you cannot have enough Ganeshes um, in your life. But Ganesh came into my life because of a secondary school teacher called Mrs. Bellis, an RE teacher. And she had studied comparative religion at Manchester. And she brought the colour and diversity of Indian religion into the classroom, which for me really contrasted against the rest of the curriculum in every other subject that I found difficult to engage in. So Ganesh, from that point, has remained and... I have been in contact with Mrs. Bellis, who's now a head teacher in a school in Shropshire, to thank her um, because she really set me on my research journey and my interest in India stemmed from that point. And you can see it's quite infectious. I've now passed it to my daughter, Megan, who has a very extensive elephant collection <laughs> and sponsors various elephants around the, the world. So we always... She's okay with me going away as long as there are elephants there that I can bring back some... <laughs> So that's something in terms of what motivated me into studying Indian religion and politics in the first um, instance at the School of Oriental and African um, Studies. But continuing with individuals that have really shaped and influenced uh, my research, but also the motivation um, to, be, to be an activist. These two books have been really um, formative. The first was written by Julia Leslie, the perfect wife. She was a Sanskrit scholar. She was also my personal tutor when I was an undergraduate. She took me all the way through, and then she dispatched me in the anthropology department because she could see that's where I should be going, and then took me back as a PhD student. Her work really shaped um, how I see the world. She taught a unit on gender, and religion that was pioneering at the time and she knew what she was giving us because when you're given a gender lens through which to view the world it becomes very difficult to step back from it and that then shapes how you understand and think about issues so it's hard then not to see injustice it's hard not to see how power shapes inequalities um, so she really gave us a gift that was important. I went on to teach that unit myself, which was um, really special. So in this particular volume, The Perfect um, Wife, she is challenging 
the very misogynistic narratives that come out of so many translations of Hindu epics. And she made it her work, her life's work, to really go through and identify the ways in which female agency and resistance and challenge to the patriarchal status quo could be seen um, in religious texts. And she, at the end of that volume, this was published in 1989, she, and this is a quote that for many years I made a point of putting into all of my work, she stated, on psychological grounds alone, it is hardly likely that half the population of India actually regarded or regard themselves in negative terms outlined by the other half. It's more probable that they either resisted altogether the interpretations foisted on them or created their own positive construct. But Indian women really that rarely want to be um, men. So that was a really important quote that comes at the end of this volume for me because it's about female agency, it's about resistance, and it's about understanding that, that nobody just accepts an oppressive situation. And as a researcher, it's my role to make audible and visible the spaces and the ways in which um, women are challenging violence and oppression. And that is a theme that comes through very strongly in the work of the anthropologist um, Anne Gold, particularly in this volume, Listen to the Heron's Words. She conducted, or does conduct, extensive field work in rural Rajasthan, which is where I did my PhD um, field work. And in this volume, she is documenting all of the folk and songs <coughs> Uh, that Indian um, Rajasthani women tell each other. And it's hilarious to read because they're very rude about their husbands. <laughs> they do not tolerate the nonsense. Um, and through those narratives, they're exchanging um, commentary on how they have resisted and how they have tried to problem um, solve. And again, what a moment I will never forget. This Anne Cold, she came to SOAS and we had this lovely conversation in... Um, cubicles, toilet cubicles next to each other <laughs> about our experiences of doing field work in rural Rajasthan. So you can't get much better than that in, but in my world. <laughs> brilliant. Um, so these are two, two academics that have really um, influenced my work in different ways. Julia, I should say, very sadly, she, she died before I finished my um, PhD. But just as she was getting to the end of of her life, I was privileged to be able to spend a lot of time with her. And in those days, we had we had reports. Our tutors wrote reports at the end of each year. It's not something I suggest it's being very time consuming. Um, but she said, in my end of first year, an undergraduate report. She said Tamsin could be good. <laughs> I said to her, Julia, what do you mean I could be good? She said, You are good. I knew you were good, but I needed to push you to be better. So that just also, to me, signals what a motivational teacher she was. She was a brilliant, brilliant teacher. Um, and I learned a lot from her in terms of the importance of being a role model myself in my, in my own teaching, not just through my research, but in how I nurture the next um, generation. So moving on from that, I'm going to take you to my field, my PhD field work in rural Rajasthan. Now, Anthropologists, our methodology is quite open-ended, which means that we need to take lots of pictures to prove that we were there. <laughs> so it might seem self-indulgent, but it was necessary in my thesis to basically have lots of pictures of me in different settings to prove that I had actually stuck it out in a village for nearly a year. And that's not easy because the heat in the Thar Desert of Rajasthan is really quite something. So here I am doing a bit of participant um, observation for my thesis. Now, my thesis was focused at the beginning on recording women's rituals to try and understand how through those rituals they convey um, their identity and we can learn or get an understanding of how they see the world, how they navigate it. It wasn't very long into my field work that I realised that violence was just a part of their everyday life, and I couldn't ignore it. So my PhD research then switched to look at, at violence and how um, women navigate it, 
people don't navigate it, the lack of support, the gaps, um, and so on. And I'm going to come back to uh, my PhD research a little bit later, but just to flip on to, to violence. Violence remains. It remains an incredibly um, problematic <coughs> issue for women's empowerment. So WHO, UN, the statistics, the prevalence data tells us that around 35% of women globally will have experienced intimate partner violence, physical, sexual violence. At the moment, there's prevalence data coming out from conflict zones, from humanitarian crises, and it shoots right up to 70-80%. So this is, um, this is an issue that we that doesn't need any more evidence. And this really is um, the problematic question is why, given all of this, why, given all of this, are we not making any inroads into reducing this problem? So that is a key question in my research now. What works? What works to end violence against um, women and girls? And at the moment, within what we call the Borg space, violence against women and and girls. There were various different um, pieces of really important research that are going on in research programs. One of which is actually saying, do you know what, we've, we've gone on about this moral argument. We don't all understand the moral argument and it's not working in terms of pouring resource into this issue. So what we have to do now is prove that there's an economic cost to not ending violence against women. So in terms of women not able to be as productive as they could be in the workplace, or just the costs associated with medical treatment, advocacy services, um, and so on. So I find that quite depressing that we're having to do that, to try and leverage more um, political support. But the linkages between economic costs and violence are quite um, stark and now evidenced quite successfully. So in terms of different approaches at the moment, to ending gender-based violence, violence against women um, and girls. An awful lot of work comes out of um, public health. So public health discourses have shaped largely the interventions that we see today. So people like Laurie Heisey, for those of you familiar um, with this field, put together, she comes from public health, an ecology model. And what she shows through that model is how violence operates in a number of different spheres. So from household through to uh, community level, national level, state level. And we need to understand the ways in which those different spheres come together to promote and to maintain violence. <coughs> and the gaps in terms of where we might expect to see support but we don't um, see it. Now, there's nothing to disagree in that approach but... My own research tries to push a bit further and say, actually, that's not enough in terms of generating answers to why it still happened and how we um, end it. Because the, kind, the approaches that come from that model tend to be quite individualistic. So we're looking at violence happens because individuals um, perpetrate. So what we need to do is to change the social um, norms that surround um, violence, that sanction violence. And yes, that's true. The normalisation of violence is really critical. And this quote that I put up here is, I could have taken it from numerous um, research projects of mine um, in different parts of the world, and even from research that I do in the UK. Husbands beat their wives, this is just what happens. If a wife does not behave, she should, she should expect to be been. And this view will come from men, it will come from um, women. So this really, this no level of normalisation is what we need to um, challenge. And as Heise says, it, you know, it spreads outwards to the state level. So if we look at a country like Sudan, I'm working at the moment on um, FGM, a woman will be arrested in public and thrown into jail for an indefinite period of time just for wearing jeans. It's that um, severe. In somewhere like Myanmar, Buddhist fundamentalists are currently blocking major strides to really embed um, gender equality across policy 
and programming. So we need to understand, obviously, why violence persists at these various levels. So yes, individual behaviour is part of that, but so too is understanding um, the ways in which state actors act to promote um, violence. And this is a quote, I won't read it out, but it comes from um, a researcher who I was working with a year or so ago in Pakistan. And again, she's making this point, you know, we can, we can challenge violence, but actually we've got, we need to see it accepted as wrong within our political and judicial um, systems. In a country like Pakistan, that just isn't happening. So in terms of my research and trying to push the way that we think about violence into um, an approach that's, that's even more complex. I mean, policymakers don't like the idea of something becoming more complex, but actually, given the fact we're struggling to make any inroads into this issue, it is necessary to take a step back and really think through more carefully. So this diagram is my attempt to just depict a, a web, a web of different factors and spheres that will intersect and interlock in different ways in different contexts. And yes, it starts with the individual at household level. But how, how are those social norms constructed? We know that violence operates to maintain social, so, certain social norms, but those social norms in turn project ideas around gender identity that ultimately also push or stress the necessity for female submissiveness, for example, and limit life opportunities for men and for women. So power is operating across all these levels. But we also need to think about, in different contexts, the extent to which religion and culture are part of shaping those social norms. In some places, they're much stronger dimension than in other places. So it's unpacking these different strands and then to weave on top of that what's called an intersectional approach. So understanding if somebody who's educated, are they any more able to resist and challenge violence? Does a person's religious identity, wealth, age, so on, have any um, bearing on their ability or likelihood of experiencing violence, but also the likelihood that they will be able to um, challenge it? <coughs> 